inspiring. It's inspiring to see so many people seeking out information about our town's history at these events. This year is for learning and reflecting on all sides of Northfield's history, and I'm glad to see so many of you participating in that. This event would not be made possible without the Northfield 350th Committee, the Northfield Cultural Council, and of course the generosity of the Trinitarian Church, who has opened their doors for so many events this year for the 350th. I'd like to introduce Gretchen holberg Cursina. Professor Grazina is a longtime scholar and is currently the Paul Murray Kendall Chair in Biography and Professor of English at UMass Amherst. Her research and writing focus on biography. She has written books on Dora Carrington, Frances Hodgson Burnett, and of course Lucy Terry and Abijah Prince. She also writes about black communities through history and books titled Black Victorians, Black Victoriana, and more recently, Black England, A Forgotten Georgian History. Her work for Mr. and Mrs. Prince, How an 18th Century Family Moved Out of Slavery and Into Legend, breaks open a previously forgotten and important part of Northfield history. So a huge thank you to Professor Christina for all her work on the subject and for being here to share the story of Lucy Terry and Elijah Prince. Can you see me over this? Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Misha. That's really kind of you. Um, it's really interesting to go back to something you wrote a while back and then try to think about it new when you've written three books in between and go back and see where was I when I did this. And I thought I would just start by giving you um, a little background on how I came to do this project and what happened and what drew me in. It all started when I moved to Guilford, Vermont, and my husband and I had built a house and we were very happily moving in. And my mother, who lives in Springfield, Massachusetts, or did, may she rest in peace, um, said, you know, there was this black family that used to live there. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? And I looked them up, and it was just, we looked over the meadow and over the mountain on the other side of our house. We could see where they had lived 250 years before. And I said, oh, what a great project. My agent was on board. I got a grant. And I sat down, and I said, I'm going to write this book in a year. The historical society's right down the road. I can walk there. And when I got there, um, their files on the princes were a single file folder. <laughs> and then I said, uh oh, this is going to take a little bit longer than I, than I thought. So I worked, we kind of worked at it for a while. And then my grant time was up, and I had to go back to work. And I turned to my husband, who is not an academic, he's not a historian, he's not African American. He's an Italian guy who was in business for many years, and I said, you're going to have to help me write this book. <laughs> when it kind of like, and so I said, well, you don't have to write it. I can do the writing part. But I need, I need someone to help me with the research because it's really painstaking. So what do you do when there are no journals, no letters, no pictures? There's nothing but scraps here and there, and you try to find what you can in the best way possible. I remember when the book was being published, my very young publicist from HarperCollins said, do you have a photograph of the princes? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, Elijah was born in 1706. That's a little bit more photography. <laughs> so um, then, so I felt kind of, how do we even start this? How do we even think about it? And then we found ourselves for a couple of years haunting Deerfield and reading their ledger books. I learned all about 18th century accounting in three different kind of currencies, which is what they did. We read all the ledger books. We read all the accounts. And I finally just started taking all the facts from every place we visited, which were numerous and putting them into a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet ended up being 150 pages long. And, and I finally, because I, you know, I put anything that might be relevant. 
and then I put it into the spreadsheet and then I could sort it by time or place or name, which helped a lot. And then I took those things by time and I printed out the calendars for all of the years I was going to be looking at. So you get a year 1727 or something, you know, along those lines. And then in each page was a calendar and I would put in all of the things from that year that I had found. And I started spreading them across my floor and I could map out where they were, when, and what they were doing. And that's how I realized that they were moving out of Deerfield at one point because the calendar was blank for three months. And then it came back. And so I said, oh, they're back in 10. So that's how you did it, was try to figure out the best method of doing it. And it was really an eye-opener to, to figure it out. So, but I, I, before I get started, I want to just say that it, this has been, I highly recommend this for a marriage, <laughs> that, <laughs> that the two of us bonded over this search. It was when a, a really good publisher, an editor, and a biographer, Stacey Schiff, whose work you may know, said to me one day, Gretchen, you have, it's, it's the quest. I said, I think it's the quest. And she said, yes. And she showed me a book that she thought would be a useful model. And so the, the book became, how did we, the two of us, find them, the two of them? How did we piece together this story? How did we find things? So you'll hear me mention Anthony, who is sitting happily at home in, in Northampton right now, because he's tired of hearing me talk. And, um, especially after three years of being cooped up together in COVID. <laughs> so that happened. He started, and then things started coming together. Because he was able, because he's not an academic, he was able to do things that I wouldn't, which was, for instance, we were trying to find, they had moved, we were trying to find the records of when they had lived in Sunderland, Vermont, after Baja died. I had the town clerk's office, I'd been there twice. It, it was just a little, like, cabin in that back part of the clerk's house. And we went there and we read all of the books and all of that, and I couldn't find these things. There was a major court case we were trying to track down. I brought him back with me one time, and he sat down and he said, Paper was rare in those days. Why do you think everything in this book would be in chronological order? And I went, oh. <laughs> and he thought for a minute, flipped, and we found eight pages of town meeting records in which they figured, and I said, okay. And, and, and all the fines went that way. I would be trying hard, and then he would just flip something, and there it would be. <laughs> and I got really, really jealous. For a long time. I do give him credit, so I... I and, you know, he knows that. Um, so I don't often get to talk about Abijah, but I will tell you that Abijah is very special. Everybody talks about Lucy Terry. They talk about her poem. They talk about the fact that she's the first known African-American poet before Phyllis Wheatley, because there's only one poem that we know, but there may be others that the family got rid of. Um, so if I, having him show up was the... Um, Wonderful thing, because then there was a team working on this together, so that was great. But then another incredible thing happened, which was I was trying to find more about Benjamin Doolittle, who was the first minister here in Northfield. He was born, um, his birth date, he, he went to, he went to um, he's from Wallingford, and he went to Yale, and then he was offered the ministership, and he came here. He had married a woman named Lydia Todd in Wallingford, and they moved up here together when they couldn't even imagine the Northfield I'm seeing out this door right now. It was really the back of beyond. You know, it was nothing was here, and he was the first person. Um, he came from a place Wallingford had was a was a slave owning place. Connecticut was quite a slave owning state. People are surprised to to realize that. Um, and we know that, for instance, in 1680, there was a record of 30 enslaved people from Barbados being sold in Wallingford for just for 22 pounds each. So that we know that that 1680, my my white ancestors arrived in Massachusetts in 1635. 
So whenever people start making comments about how long their families have been here, I say, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't expect it, but yes, we were here. Um, so when he came, he brought Abijah with him. We don't know if Abijah was in the family already. We don't know if he was a marriage gift because clergymen were often, even by their congregations, given an enslaved person as a gift. I found records of that around New England. They would feel bad for someone who didn't own somebody, so they would get together and buy somebody for them to own. And we don't know if that's how it happened. We don't know if he'd already been in the family for years and they just said, he's young, take him with you, because he was born in 1706. Roughly contemporaneous with Benjamin Franklin. Um, so then they start to come up here. I go to the Historical Society of Hartford. I think that was the one I went to. And I'm trying very hard to find things about the Doolittle family. There might be probates. There might be things that would give me some clues. And I don't like to tell, no offense, Misha, I don't like to tell these librarians what I'm working on. <laughs> because what happened was what I expected to happen. I finally just said, well, I'm looking for this person. I'm trying to track them. And before I could get anything else out of my mouth, she says, oh, we have very little, little African-American history here. And I said, you don't understand. I'm looking for the white people. <laughs> I'm looking for the white people that the black people lived in in their houses so I could understand who was where and how that was happening. And she was just totally baffled. Um, but that's how this started. So I'm doing, I, I kind of came to a dead end with the Todds, and I'm going to wrap up the title, the, the first chapter of the book, about Doolittle coming up here and what it's going to be like. And then I keep thinking, Lydia Todd, that just sounds so familiar to me. Now, my mother was a genealogist, um, and she was one of those people, who, one of those white people who got inspired by roots, <laughs> and, and everybody kind of went into the genealogy bandwagon, and that became her avocation for the rest of her life. She was semi-professional. And in fact, she'd left me three rooms of archives that I had to figure out when I emptied her house. All her records are now in the um, New England Historic Genealogical Society in Newbury Street in Boston, and they named the collection after her. She would be really chuffed about that. Um, so I said, I, I said, you know, I think there's something in here. So I, she said, well, come on down to Springfield. Don't get your hopes up. So we, I went down to Springfield. I had my hopes up. She pulls out one of her books, her many books. She didn't use a computer, so it wasn't any of that ancestry business. It was all hard-earned facts. And she's going up the thing, and then her finger goes, oh my goodness. <laughs> and I said, ah. And she said, and she pointed, Lydia Todd was a member of my white ancestral family. The man I was writing about, Abijah Prince, was owned by my family. I did not know that. Now I can't tell you, a couple of things happened. One was that everybody I told this story to somehow assumed that I was that I was descended from Baija and Lucy. And I kept saying no, no. But they could not figure out how that it could even happen. And I thought this is really obvious if you think about it for a minute, but they couldn't figure it out. Um, and then the other thing was that Everything, once I found that connection, I say it was like going into your house, going to, being invited to somebody's house for dinner, and you go in and sit down at the table, and then you realize you're in the wrong house. <laughs> That's what it felt like to me. But with that, and with Anthony, suddenly everything that had been hidden for 250 years or misrepresented or put incorrectly onto the internet, all of that started to open up. And I always, I, I, I'm not really woo-woo, you know, but we do, we do know where their house was and their cellar holes. We do not tell people because the, it was a Northfield family that actually owned the property. Um, uh, and um, they do not want people stomping around on that land. They don't live there now, but they own it, and it's been in the family for hundreds of years. Um, and I'm not going to tell people. People always say, oh, I think I know where it is. And I said, I know where it is, and you're not going to find out. You know? But we would go and sit in their cellar hole sometimes and just kind of feel what was it like. My doctor had the property next door, so she would tell us things that she had seen over the years. 
And then um, I remember one day we were sitting there, and it was mud season, so we had gone in our pickup truck. And I just, I could just see them. I could just hear them, and I could hear them say, I mean, not for real, but I could hear them say, tell our story. You're the one. <laughs> so, here's their story. <laughs> So life here would have been very different. She, Lydia, um, came here with with ben, Benjamin. I mean, with uh, with Benjamin Doolittle, 1770, 1717. They moved in. Um, his life would have been really isolated. And I'm not talking a lot about Lucy because everybody talks about Lucy. I'm giving Baija his story. Um, he he came here. <coughs> And there was just this little house. I mean, the, the town gave him some money, some firewood, and they helped him build a little place. And the family started to grow. They started to have children. He learned how to do everything. Being enslaved up here was very different than being enslaved, say, on a plantation. I don't think he knew. I don't think there were any other black people in this area. There were black people in Deerfield. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so he, he did some entrepreneurial things. He knew how to do things. He had a, you know, he could shoot, he could hunt, he could do all those things because that's what he needed to do. And then of course the French and Indian War was going on, so they really needed anybody who could help with that. The house that they lived, that they built and eventually lived in was very fortified. It was a fort to, to keep everybody safe. And I found a description that from 1744 I think it was 1744, described it as, the house in which I was born was built by Parson Doolittle. It stood behind two large elm trees a few rods north of the old meeting house. It had brick ends boarded outside. The sides were lined with three inch oak plank. It was made bulletproof. That house was later taken down. So it had to be bulletproof. It had to be a safe place where people could go in there. The house got gruesome, but you know, where's Baijin? I think there ended up being nine kids you know, in this, this house. It got very busy. <clears throat> Baijin would go to Deerfield with Doolittle sometimes. They would shop. They would um, go to Elijah Williams' store. The Williams family was very big. They became the river gods, they called them. He would run errands. And most of all, he got to see other black people. Because Deerfield, believe it or not, um, had a lot of black people. This is a map that someone drew of the street in Deerfield. 17 of the houses on the street had enslaved people living in them. <coughs> And I think a lot of people are surprised to find that out. I tried, when I was first discovering all of these things, tried to get the Deerfield to put a plaque up for all the houses that had enslaved people. They just did it this last year. And they did it while I was in London and couldn't be there to, to celebrate it. And one person told me, well, then we have to put one up for where Native Americans were, and then we have to put one up. So, so no, we can't do that. So I thought, well, that's not a nice thing. But that's OK. So um, he, he goes to, sometimes goes into Deerfield. He could see some people, and he, he meets Lucy. Lucy's story is a, a very different one. Lucy came from Africa. She's 25 years younger than he was, and he, she ends up uh, being sold, probably from Barbados. You know the triangular slave route. So they would probably have gone to Africa, <coughs> taken a load of people, and then instead of coming straight, they would go down South America, the West Indies, and then up the coast. So uh, that idea of the people being sold from Barbados is a very real one. Um, and so Hugh Hall ends up selling people in his shop. He is originally from Barbados. His father wanted him to be a minister, but he just wanted to be a businessman instead. So he, he's in Boston, and he puts advertisements in. And here's the ad we found that we think is the ad because it's from the right time and the right place where Lucy might have ended up. She was brought to Bristol, which was um, at that point, it's Rhode Island now, but it was Massachusetts then. And she says she was born, brought to Bristol. Several likely Negro men, women, boys, and girls, some of which arrived about a week ago to be sold by Hugh Hall. So we think that's where it is. And one of the reasons that we really believe that is because just about the same time, Stephen Williams of Longmeadow and a man named Samuel Terry, who was from Mendon, all had gone to Harvard 
with him and they were all good friends and they all went into his shop just about the time this ad came and they both made purchases of the exact amount that an enslaved person would have cost. So Lucy actually ended up in Menden for several years. She didn't end up in Deerfield immediately. People thought she was brought straight there, but she wasn't. Um, and then she moves into Deerfield into the Wells Thorn House. Now I, for many years, thought that this was where she had actually grown up and lived, but the white part, I'm actually gonna put a clicker on so we can see some things but without my having to <laughs> turn it on. Oops. This part on the side, oops, did the wrong thing. Right here was the original house. And she would have, they would have slept, you know, she would have slept probably by the fireplace. There was always a rifle by the back door. She might have slept in the attic, but there was a man named Caesar who was also enslaved there. They may have been up there. This part here was added much later, and I think they renovated it to all look like the old house and the, and the new house. But she didn't actually grow up in this, the white part. Um, so she's living there, and across the street is Elijah Williams' store in Deerfield. And that was right across from the Wells Thorn House. Lucy was very popular, people loved her. She was very, uh, had the gift of gab. She would work on helping people who um, were interested in, you know, she would work in the tavern that they had in there and she did all that. And then one day was this huge battle called the Bars Fight that many of you may know of, which was this Indian Native American attack on the people working in a field from Deerfield. And it was pretty scary. Uh, and she witnessed the aftermath which was um, when they brought the people back from the fight. And here is what it says. This is her poem. August 25th, 1746, the Indians did in ambush lay, so very valiant men to slay, the names of whom I'll not leave out. Samuel Allen, like a hero, fought. And though he was so brave and bold, his face no more shall we behold. Eliezer Hawks was killed outright before he had time to fight. Before he did, the Indian sea was shot, killed immediately. Oliver Amston, he was slain, which caused his friends much grief and pain. Samuel Amston, they found dead, not many rods off from his head. Adonijah Gillette, we do hear, did lose his life, which was so dear. John Sadler fled, fled across the water and so escaped the dreadful slaughter. Eunice Allen saw the Indians coming and hoped to save herself by running, and had not her petticoat stopped her, the awful creatures had not catched her, and Tommy hawked her on the head and left her on the ground for dead. Young Samuel Allen, a lack of day, was taken and carried to Canada. And so a lot of these um, battles were actually to take captives and take them up to, to Canada and then ransom them off if they weren't killed. So this is the first time that we see her writing. But we don't actually see her writing because it wasn't published for another 100 years. And it's a ballad and it's meant to be kind of sing-songy so that people could remember it. I actually met a woman um, several years back who told me her grandmother had had to memorize this poem in school in New Hampshire. And that nobody knew that it was written by an African-American woman. It was just something all the children learned. And I said, oh, I can tell you about that poem. <laughs> so Abijah, how did he become free? He's, he's enslaved for over 40 years. If you can imagine coming here as an adolescent and staying in this, this well, I don't want to say God forsaken, but it was very small <laughs> at the time and without company. And he's now becoming a middle-aged man and he decides that he might might want to marry. And the reason he can do that is because he's managed to spend some time away. He's been to Northampton. He, there are uh, black people who live there. He stayed there with some of them for a while. And we try to figure out how, how did he make himself free. Several people's families claimed that they, in fact, had freed him. And that's, if you go on the internet, please don't do it. 
But if you do, you'll find people who say, oh yes, my great, great, great grandfather freed Abijah Prince. We're so proud of him. No, he did not. He didn't even know Abijah Prince. Um, so he, he's, he decides he wants a new kind of life. Because in Northampton, he saw men who had wives and children and they had property. Ralph Way, who lived in Hadley, he was not only a property owner, but he was the first man in Massachusetts to get a divorce. <laughs> so that's his claim to fame. Um, and so I, he stayed with him for a while. He stayed with um, the Hall family, Amos Hall and his wife, and they started having kids and by two finally realized it's getting a little crowded again. So he decides this is what he needs to do. So he, he's a friend now of Elijah Williams. Um, he's become friendly with him and when now Elijah is 41, he's still enslaved, and though, though he had a certain limited freedom of movement, he was a black man with neither property nor family. We don't know what he looked like, but we know what, how he would have dressed because we have pictures of how people at that time would have dressed. Actually, somebody, I, I won't tell you who, but in Vermont, they decided to, to um, get a, um, a picture done. So they went to a local artist and said, we'd like a picture. Could you draw a picture of Abijah and Lucy? And he came back with this picture. I, I just couldn't believe it. They're wearing 1940s shirtwaist dress for her. <laughs> He's got a suit. And I said, do we know that this was the 18th century <laughs> and they were farmers <laughs> in the countryside? So I said, you must not use that. But we do know how he probably would have dressed. And so he, he decides to do something um, that we think is his way out. He does the thing that people often do when they want to run away from home. He joined the army. And he works, he, he serves under Elijah Williams. And, and, he, and armies were shorter term. You know, you didn't sign up for like three years. It was a few months here, a few months there. So he served in several places with Elijah, and then later he um, actually, Elijah moved with his wife to Enfield, which was not Connecticut then, it was still on the Massachusetts side of things. And he worked in a shop there for him too. And then he comes back, um, William sets down to reckon the accounts from his military service, and Baija is owed this enormous amount of money, just under 160 pounds, which is a lot of money at that time nearly the whole amount of uh, Lydia Doolittle's marriage portion, and it was a vast sum for an enslaved person, which at this time he still was. But even here, the accounts contain mysteries. Did he actually receive his pay, and how was, it, how was he supplied? He's listed, he's listed along with other enlisted men. He has no store debts, but Elijah's providing him things, new shoes when he needs them, things like that. And he also works alongside another man who's mixed race, Caleb Sharp, who's half Native American, half African American. And they went into business in Deerfield a little while later. They got a boat and were ferrying people. Um, so um, we don't know if Elijah held on to the money, but what we do know is that there was now um, a man that Elijah trusted living in Northfield named Aaron Burt. And Aaron Burt, because Doolittle has now died. He seems, if we could put this together right, he seems to have gone to Aaron Burr and says, I need to be free. Can you help me? We think that he took his money. The money was paid to the Doolittle family. We found, we couldn't believe we found this, Aaron Burr writing out, practicing what a manumission looked like. He actually met with um, a man named Sexton and some other people who showed him what a manumission looked like. And we found him practicing it. And then he wrote the manumission out and he um, took it, to, had to have it done in Springfield. This is where it goes. And when we were nearly done, we thought, Anthony, I, he was meeting me at the train in Springfield. I took the train up from New York because I was doing research there. It's pouring, pouring rain. The wipers are going. He tells me to drive. <laughs> so I get behind the wheel, and he said, if you could find anything, what would it be? And I said, oh, Lucy's diary. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of making up the stuff. And he starts to read something really important. Let me just see if I can get to it.
Know ye all men by these presents. This is tiny on my thing, sorry. I'm trying to read it. Um, the presents that I of that I, Aaron Burt of Northfield in the county of Hampshire and province of the Massachusetts Bay in New England, Weaver, for sundry good con considerations, me hereunto moving, have manumitted, released, and forever life that discharged my Negro man, servant or slave named Abijah. And there was his manumission sitting in the property records in Springfield. It was the only human we found in the property records in Springfield. And um, Anthony, you know, I mean, he just had earned his keep by now. We just <laughs> found this. And here we go. And we think, my goodness. So we found Bird's descendants, asked them. Of course, they were thrilled to bits. They were trying to see if they could find anything. Uh, we couldn't find anything. But we do know that Baijit is now free. And he does a couple of things. He wants to have. He wants to have property. He wants to be registered, so he gets if he gets on the poll for Northfield, he gets some property. And I think he did one other thing, I can't remember. And then he marries Lucy. And he's got everything he wanted at this point. Abijah Prince and Lucy Terry, servant of Ebenezer Wells, were married today by Elijah Williams. So we know they got married. They move into a house. Oh, I have a picture here. Agrippa Hall, which I misspelled, sorry, there's no A in there. I mean, a, there's no I after the A, um, is the son or grandson of Amos Hall, who had, Baja had lived with. Agrippa had actually started a catering business in Stockbridge, and, and one of the prince's sons worked for him. But I like this picture because it's the only picture we have of somebody who actually knew Abijah Prince. So I will just say, I look in his eyes a lot. But they settle into property in, um, in Deerfield that was owned by Wells. And you can see this map, which is 100 years after they lived there. I don't know if you can see this. It's called Abijah's Brook. And they named that property after him. And it stayed on the map in that way for over 100 years. It was quite an amazing thing. Um, so Baija, you know, after he had gone back, he moved to Deerfield. He had he'd lived in Northfield for a while in between, trying to get everything sorted out. And then he he actually worked for in Northampton for a while. We saw Agrippa, and then we know that he stayed in Northampton long enough to become a taxpayer. So this is still we're still pretty early, 1754. Um, and then um, he's, he decides that he has to have his family. We know, like, just as a quick aside, that he's about to get married because I'm reading these ledger books and I start finding things. Baija doesn't have a lot of money. The enslaved people in Deerfield have what little money they can earn. Sometimes they will catch a salmon and sell it to one of the shops or they will shoot an animal and, and get sell it to the pelt or do something. Um, and we can tell an enslaved person because they buy things to make their lives a little happier. But I just buying things to build a house. But the slave, enslaved people are buying things like buckles for their shoes. One of them bought a bird in a cage because he was so depressed that this bird would cheer him up. So, and we, they can't run away because they're very visible. And so they buy these little things. But we start seeing in the records um, that Lucy, the minute he's got his freedom, starts buying stuff. <laughs> she bought a fan. She bought pins and chocolate. Um, Abigail Wells gave her permission to work for um, Ebenezer Hinsdale, his store, and she used part of her earnings there to buy five yards of cloth. She bought some expensive cambric, and then the following January, she'd saved up to buy some linen. Um, a bit more cambric, ribbons, a double-stranded white necklace, more ribbon, a string of beads, a skein of silk thread, a thimble, a mug, buttons, five yards of a narrow gold or silver trim for clothes, a sheet of drawing paper, and she was putting together what we think is a trousseau and getting ready to get married and have her own home. Um, so she bought nothing for herself the whole time that she had lived in Deerfield um, until now. 
And then we start seeing that Bach is sprucing himself up a bit too. <laughs> he bought a yard and a half of shirting fabric and maybe Lucy sewed that up for him um, using her new thimble. Um, a few weeks later, he bought a pair of hose. Men in those days dressed in breeches, you know, with a, uh, that fastened just below the knee, so they had these stockings. Um, working men wore these long shirts and sometimes pewter buckles. And this would have been the first wedding that the people enslaved in Deerfield had ever seen among African American people. Because we start seeing some of them buying things to spruce them up too for this wedding. Um, there was a black couple who had been killed in the 1704 raid that um, had taken place much earlier. But this was a long time later. Um, and you could sense some eagerness. Lucy was very popular. She was about 30 by now. She was marrying a free and respected man who had links to other free black people in the region. And they wanted to honor them. So we see Caesar, who lived in the Wells house, bought a psalm book, both some evidence that he and Lucy had been taught to read. Um, and he took, both of them took religion seriously. Um, some other people were buying other little things. There were some other bu buckles and some other things that people were buying for this wedding. They were married in 1756 by Abijah Williams. And then um, he's only eight months after the day their first child was born <laughs> to the day, which could have been all right because she wouldn't have known. Um, so he was still the entrepreneur. He's living in this property. They built this house. He's got his own sugar, maple sugar works now, uh, buckets and taps and a sugar bush outside of the town. Um, he boiled sap. He did all of these things. And as the family grew, Lucy buys a primer and then she buys a second one. So she's teaching the children at home. Um, and then we find out, amazingly, we found their medical records. And medical records at the time were only done by the, the uh, not by what was prescribed, not by a diagnosis. And it was done in abbreviated Latin and Greek. So um, Anthony, bless his heart, went to New York to, and found the record, how do you read the Materia Medica? And he found out Bajan probably had a dis serious dislocation. Lucy had a serious postpartum illness from what we could tell. And then Bajan did an really important thing. He went to the town of Deerfield and had all the children's births recorded. All of them. Um, and I, there were two reasons. One is the Stamp Act is coming in, so they're going to tax anything on paper. It's a document. But the other is these children are now down on the record as being free and freeborn. And he put that in writing. So Baija, and I know I'm almost out of time here. <laughs> so um, Baija is the one who's making sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. They get their property in Guilford because of Elijah Williams. He's given huge amount of property in Guilford. And one of the stipulations when you're given this property is that five acres at least have to be cleared and, or, and, and you also have to take the straightest pines in order to be used as masts and float them down the river. So he needs somebody to do that for him. From all the records we could find and all the maps I drew and all the Excel spreadsheets I did, Baija is up there clearing the land. And then he's given 100 acres. And at this point, they move into the house. Um, up there, and they stay there until he dies. Now, they, not everybody was happy about it. Across the street from them is a man from Stonington, Connecticut. You can see his beautiful cellar hall. He's wealthy. On the other side is the Prince's Cellar Hall, which is much more haphazard. They did it themselves, and they weren't nicely cut the way these were. And then he really doesn't want them there, and we start seeing some really awful things happening. Houghton Tavern, which is right in the corner of where we lived, was where all the court cases would take place. And Baija was suing people right and left. <laughs> people were very litigious, but if people owed him a little money, bang, they went to court. If they, if they didn't come up to an agreement, he took them to court. A man decided to attack his two teenage sons. The older ones were gone. They, they attacked and abused them. He went to court. and. Um, so he was able to um, come back. Oh, I wanted to put this in here. This is his signature, so we know he could sign his name. When he was in, in, in Northfield, they called him the Bajan Negro. He said, uh-uh, that is not my name. 
and he smeared it out and he wrote his name in. So I, I just love him. Um, so he, Lucy goes to, and I'll do, finish up very quickly. Uh, Lucy decides that things are not going well. And then the people across the road hire people in Packer's Corner. That's where they seem to have left from. A gang of people came to the prince's house. They set their hay ricks on fire. They cut their animals loose. They accused Baja of setting his pigs onto their farm, but we, he says he didn't. Um, and if they have no hay, they have nothing for the winter for their animals. And so it gets really bad. So Lucy says, but I just am old. And she says, I am going to the governor and council. She somehow gets herself to Norwich, Vermont, waits three days for a forum, and then speaks to the governor and comes back with an order of protection. And one of the men who actually was one of the attackers later fessed up and apologized to them and paid a penalty. So Baija is such an important person here. Um, he teaches his family how to stand up for their rights. He learns how to free himself. He learns how to make his wife understand how to take care of herself and her family. We know that he starts another business of his own because we found miraculously an account book page. And we see that he's like renting out his ox and, and, and collar. He's sell, picking up things and lying and bringing them back to sell. We don't think he wrote this. We think his daughters wrote them because they were very well written. Um, but he's still an entrepreneur. And then in 1794, Abijah died at the age of 88, which was pretty amazing. Lucy almost made it to 100. Um, they, this is the probate. So Lucy says, well, you know what? He got 100 acres of land at some point in Sunderland. Let's all move to Sunderland. So her two older sons and her daughters and she trek all the way across Vermont, get to Sunderland, and find out that this man owned their property. And so what does she do? Her sons take him to court. <laughs> and it took seven years um, to, to settle the case. And finally, it was settled, and we found the lawyer for the other side's account book, the notebook, showing that Lucy did not go to the Supreme Court of the United States, but she went to the Vermont Supreme Court, probably argued her case in front of them, and then the town decides, okay, we're going to have to take care of these people. We, they tried to see if there was somebody left in Deerfield who would take her, but she was like 90 years old now, and there's nobody left. So this is where they built. This is the, the town, and I just want to point out, can I see it? I'm going to come around so I can see where it is. Right here. It says Negro. They build the house, they provide the firewood, and they support her for the rest of her life with her sons. Um, and and then she could recite the Bible. She could met, she was blind, but she could probably the New Testament. And she then goes on into legend forever. I'm going to end with a poem written by Gail Jackson, because the story is that after she moved to Sunderland, she came back every year to buy just grave. We can't find his grave because the road changed and we had a dowser came in, all sorts of people. But this poem is about their, daughter, their children and about Lucy. And I'll just end with this poem. August, now she appears as a, here's an old woman cresting a mountain on horseback the horizon at the summit familiar as the climb, but at her age, she considers it will not be many more times back and forth twice a year to his grave and the town where parts of their stories rest not in peace, but at least in their own ground. August was the 25th, 1746. What they remember was their own history rhymed in the lips of a stolen child bearing her slaved treasure, her own polished pain, hiding a gift in her mouth, Storyteller, troublemaker, Caesar, Drusilla, Tatne, DeRuxa, Abijah Jr. Marriage bought her out, and those children were more to fight for. Two of the boys in the war, girl losing her mind in poems. What they'd remember was their own. She'd remember hers. The names of whom I'll not leave out. 
The wind runs with her, its mane rush, tossing round each name, and Vija's brook winks water in sight of her property, a tune in her head, a voice on the mind of her memory, all gone over her shoulder, over green mountains, over and over since that day, in a net, without her mother, without her father, since that ship, since she'd stood and stood again to stand, Lord knows, it's a long way from where she started. Time for questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can come up to the mic here. <laughs> People never want to do that. <laughs> it's for the recording. It's for the recording, and last time we had trouble with the hand mic. So. The one question people always ask is what happened with their descendants? And I can answer that one in a minute. Well, there was a time I was trying to look for her children's names and I traced it back to some story from Spain. Uh, um, uh, it was uh, Moorish and Spanish. Which one? Story. I can't remember now. I have it someplace, but I. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious if you know where they lived here in town. I've been trying to find that out for a long time. I tried to find an early plat map, I tried to find where it was first set up. I was online. The earliest map I found was 1870, which is of course no help. So I'm hoping, I was hoping someone here would know where the town originated, what the center would have been, because usually you would have the center with a with the, all the smaller acreage around it, and then there are larger pieces of land behind it, spread out behind it. Um, I think that became less practical with the wars, but I've been not been able to find it. I would love it if somebody could find something and, and let me know. Well, I will say this, that the uh, Wells Thorn House, uh, Bill Flint did a dendrochronology thing, which he's so good at. Both pieces were built at the same time. <laughs> you know, that's really interesting because it, what they said, they did a, what do they call it, dendrochronology. Chronology. And they found different years for the two. It's a mix. Is it? Yeah. There's one house there that has wood from before the 1704 rape in the house. Right. But clearly the house is after. So they might have reused some of the wood from another house or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's been hard. I think they painted it white to make it look, because it looks much more Victorian when you go inside. It's actually blue. It was. It, is it blue? Yeah. So why does it look white here? I've been in that house. They may have painted it again. Yeah. I think so. Because uh, there was a lawyer there who painted it blue as advertising. Because <laughs> you had to do it more often and it was more expensive. Right. <laughs> anyway, it didn't look like that when Lucy was around. Some more questions. So if I understand correctly, Abijah was an enslaved person when he spent time in Northampton? Yeah. Like, what, he what amount friend. of time? I mean, and what was he Two doing years. there? What was he doing there? He was working. He worked for a man who had a hat shop. He worked for another man. He worked for several shops. Um, but if, he, they I, were letting him go. I, you know, he was an older man. Doolittle had died. They had a lot of mouths to feed. I think if he was bringing some money back, Yes, they probably they, didn't mind. It was like leased in a sense. Well, I don't know if he was leased. I think they let him work and then just give them some money. Yeah. I mean, the, I don't think they got money from the people he worked for. Um, but I found several people he had worked for in Northampton. Um, mm -hmm. And I think he would have happily stayed there. He seemed like he was pretty happy. And so then people started, um, the houses started getting crowded with babies and things. So mm -hmm. he but to but would you say that he was working? on behalf of the family, the Doolittle no, family? No, I think he was working for himself. Mm -hmm. And I think they let him do it because he I was see. one less mouth to feed. I see, yeah. And that he would probably give them some bit of the, the money. And I think that's why they had no problem letting him be freed when 
and because they've got the money. Yeah, you know? and um, I, I'm not sure that I understood exactly when um, uh, the family moved to Sunderland, well, and you showed us that plot. Yeah, you said Negro. Yeah, was that the land that they owned, or was that just what they were? She was given. After? That's what she was given. So the, the land they owned was a hundred acres, and that's yeah. why it was so. Because that's just a little piece of right. That's what you know, it's like maybe five to. acres, you know, yeah. with a garden and stuff. So in yeah. fact, she had they had sold off toward the end of Bijah's life. They had sold off a lot of their land in Guildford and just mm -hmm. kept what she kept what they call the widow's portion. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would have the five acres, and she could have a kitchen garden and a, and a small house, mm -hmm. and the rest of it was sold off. And in fact, um, I met a woman who's ancestor from Germany had bought part of the land, had bought the property and he plowed, we think he plowed under, she thinks he plowed under the gravestone. Oh. And he didn't know, but, okay. he, but she told me later, people used to drive by and say that's where this black family lived, they were so important to us here and everybody's been trying to find where he's buried. He's in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, and where is this Abijah Prince Road? Is that in Northfield? That is the, that's in Guilford. Oh, it's in It Guilford. is where his house is on that road. Yeah. Um, they, they stopped putting the sign up because high school students would steal it and they're expensive. But I think it's been up for a while now. There's also two more things. There's a marker now at the Guilford um, Welcome Center on 91. And I think, Mary, you were there when we had dedicated it, it was dedicated then. And then they're putting one up in Sunderland right now as well. So everybody's very proud. And the governor declared, um, the legislature declared Lucy Prince Day a few years ago. And there was a big thing with a gold seal on it and everything. So everybody's kind of gotten on the Prince bandwagon now, which is a good thing. I mean, we don't mind, we don't mind that. About the children. Well, I'll just quickly tell you, because we couldn't find any kids. I mean, I went as far as I could. I thought I found someone in the Civil War. One of the, two of the sons had children, had babies that died. Um, one, Festus, who was the one who was in Stockbridge for a while, he married a white woman, and they, and he moved into the Negro plot with his wife and his kids. She, he died and um, they called them the white Negroes um, because the kids were a mixed race. And then, but you know, we lose the daughters. You know, you lose all the daughters because the names, if they change, we don't necessarily know who they are and where they are. But then this intrepid genealogist, I'm all for genealogists, she's in Greenwich, New York, and she really went at it and she has found a couple of, of, of children and grandchildren. A next generation and so that's just a wonderful thing and we keep hoping things will keep popping up like that but as far as we know not everybody named Prince is descended from that <laughs> people keep writing me and say I found somebody named Prince nope <laughs> there are a lot of white people named Prince too <laughs> so yeah so anyway I think we're done and let's oh wait there's one more she's trying to come up <clears throat> how did the name Prince come about I'm not sure if, if he had it already, um, and I, I think he did because it seemed an odd name to give yourself if you don't know somebody with that name. I think he may have had it. We don't know who his parents were. We don't know if his father was named Prince. We don't know. Okay. I know. There's so much. You know, we try our best. So I just want to remind you that there will be books for sale. I think that's what you were going to say. That's what I was going to say. Yep. There's there's books for sale. And 350th swag for sale back in the lounge back here, and Gretchen will be signing his books sure. too. So come, come talk, come buy things. Thank you, everybody.